Hey, thanks for watching another video from WeldingTipsAndTricks.com. Taking a welding test is a big deal. It's a big deal because you're nervous, and oftentimes it's the difference between getting a job and not getting a job. It's the difference between being happy when getting a paycheck or walking away with your tail tucked between your legs and having to tell your your missus that you uh, you didn't get the job. So today I've got 10 tips for putting a root pass in a 3G. Uh, 3G structural welding test at 7018. Now, some bevels are 37 and a half degrees for some codes, and with that, usually there's a 1 8 gap, give or take. But for structural welding tests, most of the time it's a much steeper bevel, 22 and a half degrees or a 45 degree included angle. With a bigger gap, a quarter inch gap and a quarter inch backing plate is, uh, is often the norm. That seems like a pretty big gap, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, but um, it needs to be a quarter inch because if it's not big enough, it's too hard to get that one-eighth rod in there to, to get that root pass in. So tip number one is gap it wide enough, and that means a full quarter inch. If the spec calls for a quarter, use a quarter. Here's a diagram of the welding test. You can see how that root pass looks. The, the uh, objective is to penetrate all the way into the backing strap, tie on each plate and the backing strap together with a solid weld nugget that when that backing strap is removed and it's ground off, it's all clean and bends good. What you don't want to do is this. You don't want to penetrate into the walls and the backing strap but leave voids on either side, either lack of penetration or slag inclusions, and you don't want to penetrate deep into the sides but leave slag inclusions against the backing strap either, and you don't want to dig undercut on each side that can't be burnt out with the next pass. So, again, gap it wide enough, which means about a quarter inch. You can see if you don't gap it wide enough how far the tip of that rod is away from the, uh, from the backing plate. It's just really hard to burn in that deep. Tip number two, clean the mill scale. Now, stick welding will burn through mill, mill scale with no problem, but when you're taking a test, you want to put your best foot forward. And my advice is to clean a swath down the middle of your back and strap. You don't have to clean the whole thing, but clean the area that's going to be welded down to shiny bright metal. You can obviously, uh, there is, it is possible to pass a welding test without doing this. It's just not a good idea. And you're not going to impress the test supervisor if you don't clean anything either because it's, it's normal to clean the mill scale off of welds for a test joint. So clean it about a quarter to half inch away from the area to be welded using a grinder, flapper wheel, whatever works. Don't put deep, deep gashes in it. Try to get a pretty smooth finish, but remove that mill scale from both sides. This plate, this test plate's got a saw cut bevel on it, so it's not going to require much cleaning on that. I'm just going to knock it a little bit and call it good. And the easier way to tack them together is usually face down. And to get that quarter inch, the easiest way to do that is probably just use the quarter inch backing strap for your spacer plate. So once you get it spaced uh, like you want it, which is quarter inch again, just lay that back and strap down, centered up where you clean it. Usually, you're, you're provided with a little tolerance, plus or minus about a sixteenth, and uh, that's a matter of preference. But centering up that area that you cleaned, in this case, the back and strap's a little bit longer than the plates, which gives me a little, uh, that's, that's typical to, that it's a little bit longer, but it won't necessarily be longer. I'm just kind of centering it up on here where I don't where I don't weld where there, where it's not cleaned, and I'm going to get tacks on all four corners. And that's that. You might have one end a little bit wider than the other, and then because it's going to draw, uh, tend to draw shut a little bit as you go. You may want to put the wide spot at the top of the plate. Tip number three is plan ahead. Plan your tie-ins. 
what I mean by that is uh, plan ahead where you're going to place your tie-in, especially on your root pass. You'd like to have your tie-ins uh, not on your root bend, if at all possible, which means you're going to put that tie-in somewhere just a little bit off-center in the middle. That way, if they do cut a cut two straps right dead out of the middle, you'll still be a little bit, a little bit out of the out of the woods, or at least at least uh, you have a better shot. Tip number four: the angle of the plate matters, and height matters. You'll have a, a usually you have a choice on the height, depending on how tall or short you are. There is a place that don't put it so high that you can't see the puddle real well, and the angle matters also. Now, straight up plumb is uh, is vertical, but there's a little bit of tolerance there. And you don't want to tilt it back to you. That just makes it a little harder. So if you if you can get away with about five degrees backwards, uh, no one's going to squawk five degrees. You're well within the tolerance there. But just don't uh, just pay attention to the angles because you the more you tilt it back towards you, the more it becomes like overhead. It just makes it a teeny bit harder. Not a big deal if you have two or three degrees either way. You should be able to do it. But I'm talking about just using all the things that are at your disposal to make your chances a little bit better. You obviously can't tilt it back 45. You'll get busted out for that for cheating, but just a little bit. Just don't tilt it back to you. Tip number five, make some dry runs and practice body positioning. Here's what I mean by that. Because that rod gets shorter as you go, you need to kind of program your body movements on how it's going to feel as you feed that rod inward. Here's one method of doing it. I, I uh, just, if you don't have anything to prop on, prop with one pinky and and uh, my th thumb to pinky on the uh, from both gloves, and then that that allows me to uh, shorten the rod as I go with a built-in prop, even if I don't have a a prop. Also, you can you know obviously you can be done with just using one hand and everything, but the steadier you are, the better off you'll be. If you get your your arm all cocked up and you're in a bind, number one, you might get a big ball of fire down your where your elbow crease is, and uh, that'll slow you down. Tip number six, a file will help with your restarts. 7018s don't restart very well. They form a kind of a slag coating over the tip, and uh, if you're going to reuse a rod, it's going to start a whole lot better if you just keep a file handy and uh, scrape that slaggy tip off of there till it's... Uh, just bare metal, and that'll give you a nice crisp, crisp start. File works really good for raking slag as well, so it's good to have the file handy. Tip number seven, don't weld the root pass like this, barely nipping the edge. I'll show you that in just a sec. See, I'm not coming out very far uh, side to side here. I'm just the puddle is just barely nipping each corner. That might pass and it might not. You'd like to be a little bit more sure and and uh, take that rod out just a little bit wider and burn into each plate more. That's kind of like roll, running the ragged edge right here. It's burning into the backing plate really well. It's easy to get the rod in there because this gap is a little bit wider than quarter inch. It's, it's more like five sixteenths on the wide side of a quarter inch, but. Uh, not quite confident that it's burning in to those corners. So tip number eight along the same lines is is like this. Spend a little bit more time burning into the corners. Tip number nine, rake don't peck. A file works really good for this too instead of a chip and hammer. All right, see where I place that stop? Just a little bit off center in the in the center. So if generally if they follow the spec, that's going to be scrapped where the tie-in is. And a hard a file is much harder than a chip and hammer. It's got little you know teeth on it too, and it just works good for raking down each side of the bead, and won't put a bunch of uh, chicken marks on the uh, on the pipe. That reminds me of a story. I had a friend who uh, was working with his dad when he was early on in his career as a helper, and uh, his job was to chip chip and brush while his dad made the pipe weld and they were working out near a river and so he was just pecking 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 with that chip and hammer beating the slag off putting all kinds of dings ugly dings all over the pipe and his dad said uh, hey son let me see that chip and hammer for a minute so he, said, he handed his dad the chip and hammer his dad threw it as far as he could into the river 
So he never for, he never forgot that because that was about 10 years later when he told me the story. He never forgot that don't peck with a chip and hammer. It's made for raking. Otherwise, you, you put really, really rough looking dings that actually can uh, fail you on a welding test. You got all those little peck marks on the base metal. So this is a chip and hammer. I've got a fresh sharpened point and a fresh sharpened uh, flat chisel area on it too, but still use, use it for raking and not for, uh, if you peck, do it just be really, really gentle and uh, really accurate so you don't damage the uh, area outside the weld. You're not going to impress any test supervisor with a bunch of a bunch of big divots all in the base metal where you've whacked it. So chip it, get all the slag off, brush it real good. Tip number ten: If if allowed, and you're not always allowed, use a grinder for your. Uh, to clean up your tie-ins where you stop and start. I say if allowed because they're not a grinder is not always allowed. I have taken tests where once you got the joint tacked up and ready to go, the grinder was locked up. But most times, more reasonable than that, they recognize that uh, the grinder is just a tool that's going to be used in the field and so they'll let you use it on a welding test also. So just clean in the back a little bit, a little bit more of an angle, gives you a little bit more of an area to uh, to make a good tie in like that. Also, you can kind of use it to rake down the sides and get any extra slag off the, uh, the toes of the weld. Or if there's a little bit of undercut, you can kind of blend it out and make it make your increase your chances of burning any slag that there might be out of there. All right, here's the tie in on that. Uh, light up ahead of the tie-in and come down into it and then just carry on. That does leave some crap to burn out but usually it's not a problem unless you hang around a long time and deposit a whole lot of junk but it's good to deposit any arc strikes like that over an area where you're gonna remelt rather than especially rather than outside the joint arc strikes outside the joint are cause for uh, for getting failed. Depends on the strictness of the supervisor if they'll let you grind them or, or not, but oftentimes they're a reason for failure. You see why why I sharpen the chipping hammer here is it's just uh, really helps to have a good sharp blade on there to rake slag off the toes of the root pass. Once again, if it is allowed to use a grinder, it's a good idea to grind your uh, any high places you have on stops and starts, and that's the root pass. All right, a few more tips. Generally, every every uh, 7018 manufacturer is a little different, but 105 to 120 amps is probably a good starting point, or at least hot enough that it won't stick. Keep a tight arc and shoot for a 90 degree angle. You'll probably be pushing a little bit, but aim for a 90 degree angle and you'll be in good shape. Thanks for watching. Stay tuned for part two, which is the fill and cap.